Hello everybody, Jason here from the At The Coalface podcast. I've created a new sub-series called Mentoring Moments, and Mentoring Moments is composed of clips taken from my one-on-one and group mentorship sessions where we discuss e-commerce, digital, retail, and so much more. Hopefully you get a lot out of this. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. I am here once again with Sean Mellis for our one-to-one mentorship session. And he brought up something that I think is super useful to lots of people and super relevant, particularly in today's world where we have a contracting global economy at the moment. There's challenges on the horizon. And as businesses continue to try to scale and particularly agencies to continue to scale or at least tread water so they're not going backwards, we have this tug of war that happens oftentimes in agencies where you're trying to grow your business or you're trying to at least not shrink the business, but you also want to make sure that you are continuing to capture and that you are continuing to define and live by the ICP, the ideal customer profile that you've already defined for your business. And oftentimes an ICP evolves over time. And Sean, we were talking about this before we we went live. An ICP will necessarily change over time for most businesses as they evolve, as they grow, as they mature, as they target new ideal customers based on their experience of their ideal customers. So when you start out, you won't necessarily know what your ideal customer is until you've got a bit of a track record of delivering for a certain type of customer. And then that will evolve over time. And you'll look back over a track record of say 50 customers and you'll go, okay, there's five qualities that these 50 customers that we've done great work for all have in common. Or Uh, there's a subset. Okay, we've worked with 50 customers. There's 30 of these that have turned out really well. And therefore, we'd like to go out and target more like that. Whereas 20, maybe that didn't work out so well. Either maybe we weren't profitable, or maybe we didn't do our best work, or maybe they weren't happy, or whatever the case may be. So your ICP when you first start out as a business, or what you think your ICP is going to be, maybe isn't always what your ICP is going to be. But off the back side of that ICP discussion is the discussion of how to gracefully egg potential engagements where let's say a customer has approached you and said, hey, I would love to work with you or I think we would be a good fit. Let's talk. Let's see if we're aligned. And there's different places at which you may see some red flags as an agency or as a, let's say it's a consultant or whatever it is your role is. Mm. There are certain points waypoints along that journey of first introduction and first coming onto the radar of a client or them coming onto your radar, first engagement, first alignment call, all the way through to the point of actually signing on the dotted line. At any point along that journey from introduction through to signing on the dotted line, there may be red flags or there may be situations where you go, maybe this potential client isn't a great fit for us, or maybe we're just not a great fit for them and we're not going to be able to do our best work. And so we don't want to take this engagement any further because we're not going to be able to provide the value that we expect of ourselves in a given engagement, right? That's going to make us look good. That's going to paint us in the best light and is going to ultimately lead to more business. And so I think the challenge is how do you gracefully exit those negotiations or those discussions particularly where the customer really wants to go ahead. The customer really wants to proceed. Sometimes the Mm. customer will come to that same conclusion at about the same time as you. And that's an easy one, right? That's an easy discussion. It feels like we're on the same page here. It feels you have some needs that we can't fulfill. And so therefore, we'd like to point you in another direction. We'd like to point you in a direction of somebody that we think can really help you and is a great match for you because we're clearly not. And if you can have that, if it's very obvious to both of you at the same time or roughly the same time, that you're not a great fit, that's an easy discussion. The hard discussion is when you believe you're not a great fit, but they think you are. That's when it becomes difficult. And when they particularly, and where I found this to be especially difficult is when they say, hey, can you fire off a, can you get us a proposal as soon as possible? We really would like to start working with you as soon as possible. We think this is a great fit. We think you'll be able to help move the needle in our business significantly and very quickly. Let's start working together. And then it's at that point, if you feel like there's some red flags in play, then it's like, how do I get out of this gracefully? And I think it's about more than anything else. I think it's just purely about being honest. I, th- I think you don't have to be brutally honest, but I think you have to be honest. And I think you have to tell them how and why 
you don't think you're necessarily a good fit for them so that they have so that they don't just think you're blowing them off or you're too busy or what we don't want is we don't want them to make assumptions as to why you're bowing out of that engagement before they've even signed on the dotted line. If they if we leave them in a situation where they have to make assumptions about why you've bowed out, then that can do brand damage to you because then they might be making the wrong assumption and they might put that out into the world. They might be talking to other people or potential clients of yours and say, hey, we got blown off at the last second right before deal signing. It wasn't very respectful. We don't. We still don't really know why they didn't want to work with us. And they feel sometimes what they might say is they might say, oh, this company's a bit flaky. But we engage with them. We spend a lot of time with them. And then they ended up blowing us off. So what we don't want, we don't want your potential customers making any kind of assumption about why you decided not to work with them or why you decided you don't think there's a good fit there. So I think what we want to do is we want to control the narrative, right? And the only way we can control the narrative is to be transparent and to be honest and to have those hard discussions. And, and trust me, I've had to let potential customers down gently before. And it is sometimes a very uncomfortable discussion. But I always start out with explaining how we go about choosing the clients that we work with. So that's how I usually start the discussion. I'll be like, hey, we choose clients that we work with based on these four or five really critical criteria because we know based on our experience that these are the types of customers that we do the best work for, that we get great outcomes for. And if we stray too far from these criteria, then we have seen situations where we just can't do our best work and it ends in tears for all parties. And so that's what I would start out with. I'd start out with a dialogue around, hey, we don't just arbitrarily decide who we work with. We have a very methodical framework that we go through to make sure and ensure that we can get great outcomes for our clients. And this is what our framework looks like, just for the sake of being transparent. Now, we've had some fantastic discussions with you. We appreciate you coming to us. We love the idea of potentially working with you in the future. But for right now, we don't think we're a great fit because of these top three reasons, X, Y, Z reasons, and give them, give them some real, genuine, meaty reasons that, that are real, and then say, hey, look, but that doesn't mean this will always be the case. We're hoping that at some stage in the future, we'll either be at a place or you'll be at a place where we're a better fit and hopefully we can, we can work together in the future. But for right now, these are the two or three reasons that we don't think we're a great fit right now and we won't get the outcome that you expect from us and that we expect from ourselves. So what we're going to do is we what we would like to do is to point you in the direction of another agency or another consultant or whatever it is that we think is a better fit for you right now. And then maybe in the future we can work together. Now, this is a common thing that agencies have to do when they pass work to me. Oftentimes, when a customer goes to an agency that's an e-commerce development agency in particular, they are not ready to engage with an agency yet. They can't even get through discovery and provide all the answers that the agency needs during discovery to even put an effective proposal together to deliver on the customer's requirements if the customer doesn't even know what their own requirements are yet. And so mm. oftentimes, an e-commerce agency might hand that client to me and they say, hey, look, they're a little bit early for us. They're not quite there yet. They can't really answer the discovery questions. They don't really have a clear BRD yet, business requirements document yet. And they don't even really know how to get to a stage where they could draft one. So mm -hmm. they're a great fit for you. You go away, you work with them through this messy first bit to help them arrive at a really solid BRD that we can understand and put a proposal against as an agency and then hand them back to us. And so this is a very common thing that agencies will find themselves in the middle of is, is customers that are just not quite ready yet to engage with an agency because they don't know what they don't know. And they need maybe a consultant or they need, they need to take a bit more time internally, or maybe they need to spend a bit more time on internal strategy development before they go out and engage an agency on delivery of the tactical implementation of their strategy, right? So. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty common thing. Based on my experience, the best thing to do is to have a clear framework for selecting clients that you think are a great fit for you. If a client isn't looking like they're going to be a great fit, be early and honest with your feedback and transparency with them about your framework and about how you go about working with clients, about why you don't think you're a great fit for now. Keep the door open to future engagements and help them exit the discussions with you gracefully by pointing them in a direction you think will genuinely be a better fit for them than you. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that. And it's a great approach to be transparent. I did wonder though, what if it's a good fit both ways, but you're just dealing with a 
bit of an a-hole. You, you don't like the person because they've said some things that's just not resonating with you or the communication's been sloppy, it's been direct, it's been blunt, whatever it is, you picked up on something where you know this is going to be a good relationship because you've spotted things like this in the past and it's led to not a great time in terms of a client relationship. How do you gracefully say no in that circumstance when it's a perfect fit for the business and the ICP, but the lead stakeholder you'll be dealing with isn't someone you think is going to be fun to work with? That's probably the most difficult scenario to exit gracefully. But again, I always go back to, I would rather be honest, again, not brutally honest, but I would always rather be honest. uh, And I guess I have that luxury as a consultant that doesn't have 15 mouths to feed in the business. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a little bit easier for me to decline an individual client. But I guess in that scenario, it's important. It's probably more important that you go back to your team and explain why you declined working with that client than it is actually declining the client. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by this. So when you've got a team that needs to be fed and you're wanting to grow your business and whether they're worried about their paycheck or they're not is irrelevant, but they, you need to be transparent with them that some of the decisions you make around ICP and specific clients to work with is to protect them more than it is to protect you. And what I mean by that is, is if you have somebody who is going to be totally disruptive to your business, is going to perhaps monopolize your time, be ultra demanding, is going to berate your team members, no matter how good of a job that they do, or there is that risk, or there is that fear, or it is just going to be demoralizing to your team to have, you know, your team well, you know what you're able to deliver on. You'll never be able to make this customer happy for whatever reason. Then I think it behooves you to go back to your team and say, look guys, on paper, this client may look like the perfect fit for us, but I can tell you after having these one-on-one engagements with them, that they wouldn't be, that they Mm. would be demoralizing for our team. And here's why, here's why I declined. I respectfully declined this business. And I will always respectfully decline business that I know is going to be destructive to our team. And regardless of how much money we might make out of a deal, I have to protect my team first because they're the ones that are delivering the work for the client. And ultimately, if one single client creates bad blood amongst the team, that ultimately affects all of the work that you do for all of your clients. And you can't allow one client to be so disruptive that you can no longer deliver effectively for the rest of your clients. You just can't, right? And so you have to be a little bit ruthless in that regard. I would say that I would fire a client in most instances before I would fire a a team member. Uh, So we have to defend our teams. We have to defend the people on the ground doing the work. We have to really defend them at every opportunity particularly if they've shown the ability to do good work and and you know that you have to put them in the right situations and scenarios to win. You have to set them up for success instead of failure. And you have to make it very clear to them, I am trying my best as the owner of this business to set you up for success. And I believe I'd be setting you up for failure if we took on this client, right? And I think you need to be transparent Within reason, you have to be as transparent as possible with those potential clients as well and say, look, on paper, it looks like we'd be a good fit. And on paper, it looks like you're almost like the perfect client for us. But we also have to have, we have to have personalities that mesh as well. There's the intangibles, there's the tangibles. And on paper, the tangibles look like we would be a great fit for each other. But just in our conversations so far, I get the sense that you have some expectations that I don't in my heart believe we can fulfill for you. And I don't want to go into engagement when I know, or at least I have a high level of certainty based on my knowledge of my team and how we work and how we deliver work. I have a high level of confidence that we would not be able to deliver to your standard and your expectation personally. So whilst on paper, I think it looks like we'd be a great fit based on the fact that you would be the one ultimately judging our success or failure not the company, but you as an individual are going to be signing on the dotted line and you're going to be judging our success or failure. I don't believe we would live up to your standard and your expectation. So for that reason, I'm going to point you in the direction of somebody else that I think is probably a better fit and can maybe live up to those expectations that you have of us. Yeah, that's a tough one, but very well said. And look, I think people value that level of honesty. And sometimes they'll, sometimes if they've been, if being a bit of a badass 
has been a little bit of a front. And I've had this situation before too, where customers have come in hot and strong and they have seemed like they would be super challenging to deal with and virtually impossible to please. In fact, I had a recent, I had a recent situation almost exactly like this in the last six months. I had a situation like this where a customer kind of came in hot and strong. They, they seemed, at least in the first two calls I had with them, that they had very clear ideas of how they wanted to go, both technically, operationally, business process. Uh, they, and then they had their own in-house development team that they've been running for over four years. And they, it felt like they very much had really set in stone ideas of where they were going to go. And I thought, what am I going to contribute in this environment? How am I even going to be able to contribute anything to this discussion? If you're so dead set on the direction that you're going to take as a business, why are you even hiring a consultant if any advice that I give is going to be tossed out the window in favor of what you guys, it sounds like you're, you've got such momentum on the path that you're on that to change course now feels like it's almost impossible. And you're almost, and I told them this, I told them this flat out. I said, it feels like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I said this, I said, correct me if I'm wrong, I get the sense that you want to bring in a consultant to validate the direction you're already going. I yeah. said, and that's, and I said, that's not me. I'm not that guy. I'm not going to just be a yes person to validate a direction that you're already going if I genuinely feel that it's not the right direction for your business. If I dig in under the bonnet and we do deep dive discovery together and the direction that you're going, I don't feel is a good fit for the goals and objectives that you set for your business. And I think going a di different direction is the right path for you, both technically, business process, maybe even org design, et cetera. All the things that you've hired me that you're saying you're hiring me to give you advice around, I'm going to give you really transparent advice, right? And it feels like we would not be a good fit because you're already on a path. You're already on a very well-defined path. So I said, for that reason, I don't think I'm a great fit. And I think I will ultimately end up disappointing you. And I said, the last thing I want to do is end up disappointing a customer in the very first engagement. In the first five minutes of engaging together, I turn around and I disappoint them. And I don't help them with all the things they want to achieve because I am not aligned with how with the direction that they want to go. Yeah. And and so they were taken aback by that. There was just silence on the other end of the phone. They didn't really know how to react to that level of honesty. And they said, oh, thank you very much. Really appreciate your honesty. Let us go away and let us think about this and we'll get back to you. And I thought, well, that's, I'll never hear from them again. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll definitely, they, I've obviously pissed them off and they were just being polite and exiting the call. But then I heard from the GM of the company via email within two days, I heard and the GM of the company was like, no. We, we actually realize we need somebody like you who is not going to be a yes person, who is going to challenge our thinking, who is going to challenge the way that we think we're going, that we think is the right way. It's clearly not the right way because of these three things that have happened, say, for example, in the last six months that have proven that the direction we're going is not ideal. It might be partially ideal, but it's not ideal in these scenarios. So we know that we need in these areas and we're definitely willing to take on advice and we're definitely willing to be open to new ways of thinking. Hmm. And then we engaged and it was a fantastic engagement. And so I think sometimes being that level of honest right up front can almost call their bluff. And sometimes someone will lower their guard and they'll come in with kind of their guard right up. And it will seem like they're totally intolerable in terms of being able to work with them. And then ultimately, they let their guard down because you're honest. And then they become a really good client to work with because you've set the groundwork that you're not going to just be a yes person out the gate. And, yeah. and sometimes it's that level of respect that you generate in that discussion that makes all the difference in the world. Because if you don't start off on the right foot, you'll never end up on the right foot. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I'm in a similar or was in a similar situation. So it's good you've had a recent experience and I should have approached it that way. Luckily, the the, the client pulled out or the prospect pulled out at the last mile. But yeah, just controlling that narrative and being honest and it's really being human. I think they'll respect that. If they come off a bit aggressive because they're passionate and want certain goals met and they must have pressure elsewhere to meet these goals within this time frame, if you challenge that ideal and show them the same kind of passion and transparency and honesty in return, they'll probably be more likely to move forward as you experience. Totally. Look, man, look, none of these discussions are fun or easy to have. I think, yeah. I think as we mature as business leaders and look, you're still young and, but you're very mature for your age and you've got a lot of responsibility on your shoulders for your age. 
I think leaning in, and I had an old boss in an agency job that I had years ago. And he said, look, because I, I had very similar questions to, to what you had, because of course mm -hmm. I was in the pre-sales, largely involved in pre-sales engagements with clients at that time, where we were talking about technical solutions and almost on the fly in pre-sales discussions with clients, you're brainstorming at the same time to show them that you have the credibility that you can work with them. And so that's the scenario that I found myself in. And there were times when we had to have very uncomfortable conversations with clients. And I shied away in the early days, I shied away and let him have all the difficult, I had the fun conversations and I let him have all the difficult conversations as the agency owner. But he, he said to me one day, look, you just have to learn to lean in to these difficult discussions because I am giving you, okay, yeah. you're not responsible for the success of this agency. I am. I'm putting you in situations that are uncomfortable. Yes. And I realize that, but here's an opportunity for you to learn and lean into these difficult discussions on my dime, on my responsibility. When you're not the owner, you're not the founder, you're not responsible for the outcomes here. You're responsible for doing great work and being honest with clients and, and trying to land clients that are going to be a good fit for our agency. So lean into this, lean into these, lean into this learning opportunity, lean into this challenge and know that you're not responsible for the outcome. I'm responsible for the outcome, but I'm giving you the air cover to have these difficult conversations with clients because we do need to vet clients hard to make sure that we're taking on clients that we can actually deliver for. So I think that was such a useful, that was such useful advice. And I will always respect mm. that because he gave me the opportunity to jump right in the deep end of some very hard conversations. And it's the skills developed through having repetitive, hard conversations at board and CXO level and over and over again it desensitizes you to having those hard conversations with really powerful people, really powerful yes. decision makers. And I'm just so thankful that, that I had that opportunity all those years ago because I'm dealing with decision makers on the daily now in my consulting business. I literally only deal with decision makers because usually only decision makers can hire outside consultants to work with a company. I, you know, I'm so desensitized to this now that I can treat them just like any other person in the business. I still have respect for them just like I would for any other person in the business, but I don't put them up on a pedestal mentally and emotionally to where I come in at a disadvantage in the discussion. I yeah. come in, I come into all these discussions feeling like I'm on a completely level playing field with these people. And they really, they respect respond to that and they respect that. And so I, I think that would also be a piece of advice is when you are making these decisions and when you are having these discussions, if you're COO or uh, let's say you've got a salesperson on your team, or if you've got other people that are part of this decision-making process within your business or will be in the future, and you're, you're grooming them to help you take on these difficult discussions, expose them to these discussions, have them listen in, have them shadow you, have them start taking over some of the elements of negotiation and discussion and only maybe bring you in if something gets really heated, for example, or really needs the founder's authority in the discussion. That would be my advice too, is to, I had that opportunity as a junior to have those hard discussions because the agency principal was giving me air cover to have those discussions and was backing me up. And I, my advice to you is, take every opportunity you can to provide that same kind of coaching environment for your team because it will pay you massive dividends in the future. As you look to slowly withdraw out of the operational day-to-day -day of your business, your team members need to understand the framework that you go through when you are vetting clients for success. And if they can get in your head and you can have that dialogue with them after you come out of a meeting, for example, if you can be transparent with them, it will pay you just, it's actually hard to describe the value that will bring to you. I'll be sending this snippet to someone in particular within the team. He'll enjoy it. But yeah, I've been in a similar position and it's time to, to make that transition through shadowing, encouraging, throwing yourself in the deep end and growing, being in that growth mindset as you go through these more difficult interactions. That's the only way you're going to deal with more difficult interactions after that. And I totally agree. The more decision makers you speak to, the more hard conversations you have, the easier it becomes. doesn't matter if it's bloody CEO, he's just talking to another person and you've got that confidence that this person doesn't know better about the topic than you do. You're the SME. So act like it kind of thing. You step into your own shoes and have that confidence that what you're saying is expert knowledge. So it's good when you cross that threshold. And I think I crossed that threshold maybe a year ago prior to that massive imposter syndrome. But uh, yeah, once you're there, it's great.
It is. I tell you, and it just it makes those conversations flow because I think people can sense it. It's almost like dogs can smell fear. Sometimes people in powerful positions, if they sense fear in you, they'll take advantage of that because they'll know that there's that power play at play and they'll try to take advantage of that in some instances. Um, whereas if you come in and you feel really confident in what you're saying, because that's your domain and really that's the area that you own and whilst respecting the areas that they own and that they know about and the position of leadership that they have, I think that you can establish camaraderie and mutual trust very quickly in those environments. And mm. they won't, I guess, take advantage or they they will not smell the fear on you because you, you legitimately don't have the fear. Initially, you have to fake it till you make it. And you yeah. just have to keep putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions. But once you get there mentally and emotionally, it's, I tell you, it's really a relief when you can start going into those conversations full of genuine confidence. And like you say, you can almost identify the moment at which the light switch flipped for you. I remember that too. And I remember that it was a gradual process, but it almost felt it, at the final step of that hurdle, it did feel a little bit like a, a light switch. Yes, it's a progression, but at, at some point you just, it's almost like your old fears just fall away. The cloak of fear, yeah. the cloak of self-doubt just falls away almost in an instant. And all of a sudden it's like you level up really quickly at that last hurdle. And it's such a great feeling. And I tell you, it does wonders for your business. It does wonders for your team because what happens is then you're able to share that confidence with your team and you're able to give them the air cover to develop under your wings of protection where they can ultimately arrive at that same place uh, of confidence. And ultimately that's gonna, we want people to succeed and every person's definition of success is different, right? And their definition of success will evolve as they evolve and as they grow and as they mature. And they're going to be looking for different things out of their roles. And they're going to be looking for different things out of your business to be fulfilled and to stay fulfilled over time. That's going to evolve. And if we can recognize that and we can help them become a more well-rounded human, not just employee, but we can help them become a more well-rounded human that will not only benefit them, but it will benefit us massively as a business at the same time. For sure. For sure. Sounds like you're on the right track, man. Sounds like you're, sounds like you're well on the right track, but fantastic question. I think it led to a really great conversation. So thank you for consistently bringing fantastic questions and fantastic discussions to the table. Very welcome. Hey, everybody. I'm here again with Michael on one of our one-to-one -one mentorship sessions, and he raised a good question that I think will hopefully be helpful to a broader audience here. And he said, look, we oftentimes we have this agenda where we talk about different items that are relevant to him and the agency that he's working in at the moment and projects that he's got on and situations um, that have happened over the prior two weeks. But this week, he wants to flip the script a little bit and say, and ask, a, I guess, a more helicopter view type of a question, which is, how did I get to be where I am? Or how did I get to learn the things that I know? Or how can someone go down a little bit more uh, of the journey or the path that I went down? And how did I get to be where I am versus some of the more structured agenda type questions that you've asked previously? Am I explaining that properly, Michael? Yeah, that's right. It's a, a good way of feeding it back. <laughs> nice. Look, I think that we all have a unique stack of experiences that make us uniquely us. And I think that one of the things that I had, it was a double-edged sword. And where I learned the most, there were two situations in particular where I probably had my learning accelerated the most or the fastest uh, during, if I look past, back over my 20 plus year career in digital and e-com, there's two distinct experiences or sets of experiences that I can look back and be, and I can call them transformational in my learning journey. And I'll share those with you. And they may not be specifically applicable where you can go, okay, I'm going to go and do this tomorrow, but they may help you to try to identify similar pivot points in your journey where you can apply some of this thinking, if nothing else, to your journey and say, okay, how can I put myself in some of these positions to perhaps have a similar type of outcome, a similar type of opportunity, if nothing else. And I think that one of the things is one of the previous agencies that I used to work for years ago, I, by virtue of it being a relatively small agency, I mean, when I started there, they had about 30 staff. I think at one stage we got up to a maximum of about 40 staff. And then for a whole lot of reasons, that I won't get into details, 
we eventually ended up being a much smaller team. We ended up being around a 15 person team in the end. And so during that transition, I was with that agency for over five years. And what I started doing when I first started there, because when I first started there, I had just sold my own online business. So I had my own online business for about seven years. I wanted to go back into the workforce. I had a pretty decent exit. Didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. I didn't want to do my own thing. I wanted to go back and make sure that I was current on the industry and make sure that I was staying up to speed with what was going on. And so I wanted to go into the agency space, but I tell you, it was really difficult to find an agency that was willing to take a chance on somebody that had been a business owner for as long as I had been a business owner. Because a lot of agencies had the thinking or the expectation, this guy is going to be completely, he's owned his business for so long, he's going to be completely untrainable, he's going to be completely uncoachable, he's going to be, he's going to be difficult to manage because he's owned his business for so long, how is he going to, how is he going to be able to take and accept someone else being his boss as opposed to him being his own boss. And so those were a lot of the discussions that I had early on. Ultimately, I had an agency that was willing to take a chance on me. And when I first started there, I was an account manager on the digital marketing team. And so I was working directly with clients across Google Analytics and a lot of their marketing services that we were delivering to them. And that really got my feet back into e-com in a broader. And then As I worked my way through that business, as I became more mature in my knowledge and in my capability, because I was exposed to some pretty complex client accounts, putting together pitches, putting together monthly reports, putting together monthly presentations to existing clients, working with our internal delivery teams that were delivering marketing services. It was a trial by fire, so to speak, because a lot of these things were, I knew I was running marketing for my own business, digital marketing with Google ads, et cetera. And I owned and managed all of that for my own business. But in order to do it in such a way that you demonstrated ROI for another business owner, that was a whole new kettle of fish for me. And it was a whole new level of responsibility. When a client back in the day was spending $20,000, $30,000 a month with you in conjunction with their ad spend, it's a pretty significant commitment. And they do expect a certain amount of feedback. They do expect a certain amount of proven ROI to justify your existence as being their digital marketing partner. And we were also their development partner. So we did development and we did marketing as an agency. Now, I don't recommend most agencies do this, but our agency did. And so we were both building the websites for them. We were enhancing the websites for them and we were doing growth and marketing services for them. And so at the time, this was primarily through Google, a little bit through Facebook, not as much back then, but certainly Google was a huge part of that, both organic as well as paid and performance, some other channels as well, other paid channels as well, but it was primarily Google. And I tell you, that was certainly a trial by fire. It was certainly being dropped in the deep end of the space. And then as the longer I was with the agency, the more I branched out in terms of my capabilities, my knowledge, I was hungry to learn. I was, I found that I had a real joy and love of the more technical side of the business. I I got along probably better with the developers in the business than I did the anyone else in, in the business. And I spoke their language and I just had a natural affinity for the more technical side of things from a solution architecture, from a discovery perspective. I just realized that I had a real love of broader business consulting as opposed to just consulting on the marketing aspects. And luckily, the business was flexible enough to allow me to expand what I did over time and to take on a broader set of responsibilities. Some would say they dropped me in the deep end in certain situations, and that was fine. And there was definitely times where I felt that there was some imposter syndrome going on where I'm going, shit, okay, I'm expected to give a level of consulting on certain things that I'm not ready yet, or I don't feel I'm ready yet to give consulting at that senior level, boardroom level, CXO level, type of consulting, leading discoveries, you know, capturing requirements, giving guidance and consulting around requirements, both technical as well as business process, organizational design, data structures, and things like that. I was still learning myself. I still felt yeah. like I had a lot to learn. My boss at the time, there was two things that he said to me that made me feel a lot better whenever I felt overwhelmed. And now I never feel overwhelmed. And I'll tell you why. It's not because I'm arrogant, but I'll, give you, I'll tell you why in a second of why I now no longer feel overwhelmed. It's that he said, look, you only have to know a little bit more than the client. You don't have to be God. You don't have to be, you don't have to be, you don't have to be Rand Fishkin. You don't have to be Avinash Kaushik. You don't have to, you don't have to be the world's best e-commerce guru to add value to our client engagements. You just need to know more than them, at least in certain areas. You just have to have more knowledge, more experience, and more capability to articulate those things more than they do. And that will present 
value in ways that they just, they don't have the ability to do these things internally. So that was the first thing. I felt a lot of pressure unloaded from me when the boss said that. And he just said, look, you just have to lean into this. Nobody knows. You can't go to school to learn the stuff that we learn. You can't go to school to know the stuff that we know. So what you have to do is you just have to dig in. You just have to figure it out as you go. You have to figure out how to develop your own processes to achieve a great outcome for us and for the client. And you just have to, it's practice, right? It's practice about how to develop your own process to do a deep dive discovery, to, to make recommendations, to do the consulting. You just have to be at the coal face, working in it, living it, eating, sleeping, breathing it every single day. And there was there's certain things that I did, for example, because I was working primarily with Magento at the time, I went through their full solution specialist certification training once they made that available and they made that certification available. I went that, through that full training and then I, and by that time I've been working with Magento for a while, so I knew quite a lot already. I went in, I took the exam, passed it first go. So that helped to give me a little bit of confidence that I knew yeah. it made me feel less like a fraud, so to speak, because it was like, okay, I've got this formal qualification. I do actually know how to architect solutions on this platform. I do actually know what I need to know to be able to take a set of business requirements and turn that into and translate that into a set of technical requirements that the technical team can now understand and deliver against and quote against. I was. It was a whole process of five or six years of really being dropped in the deep end into some really difficult situations where I was expected to help pretty large, pretty complex brands figure out the best solution for them from an e-commerce or omni-channel. In some cases, this was, this was before really truly omni-channel solutions were the norm. This was the early days of true omni-channel. And a lot of businesses still treated online quite independent of their physical store chains and the way that they dealt with customers in physical stores. Their click and collect hadn't really been heard of. Some places did it, but it was really more like an email request. It wasn't like a formal click and collect functionality yeah. or ship from store functionality. That stuff wasn't really that common back then. And I got to see all of this stuff go from very early nascency all the way through to becoming mainstream. I got to see all of these new expectations in terms of what the consumer expects and therefore what brands are trying to deliver for the consumer. I got to see that massive evolution from the very, very earliest days of e-com to today. And so that served me very well. But it really was, look, I had to develop my own systems, my own processes. We had certain sort of templates, if you will, around like solution specification documents and things like that. But they didn't always work for me. They worked, maybe they worked as a starting point, but I had my own thinking about how we would go into discovery. I had my own thinking about how we could best get a great outcome for the, for the merchant. I had my own vision for how we could deliver those services in a streamlined, efficient way for the customer so that we could build quickly, so that we could get to an MVP really quickly and get live very quickly. Because I had watched our business analyst and our solution architect architect pre me, I'd watched yeah. how they did things. And I liked some of the things that they did, but I didn't like other things. And I thought we could maybe improve upon this. So when it was passed over to my plate, it's okay, you're now going to do all of this work. I took what they did and I iterated upon it and I made some pretty significant changes over time. I kept the stuff that I thought worked well. I jettisoned the stuff that I thought didn't work well. And I was the first one in our business to build and document and formalize a proper end-to-end -end solution specification for all of our projects and create a standardized way of documenting that in a very technical, so it was a combination of a tech spec and a funk spec all in one. Okay. And, and we didn't really have the concept of a BRD back in those days. So instead of starting with a business requirements document and then creating a solution specification on the back side of that, this document was an all in one. So it was a it was requirements, it was a funk spec and a tech spec all in one document, which meant that this document was like 60 pages long, which was a lot of work to deliver. But I knew if I was that thorough up in the engagement with the client, it would lead to a great outcome. If they signed off on that and they said, yep, this is what we want, yep, this is what we need, then we could go away and we could deliver really effectively against that level of detail. Now, I do things slightly different now, but that was that whole process of learning was enabled because my boss allowed me to, and, and in some cases, I had to take over certain roles in the business when people left, I had to take over certain responsibilities because after a while, I ended up being the most tenured person in the business. And so it was like, okay, Jason needs to take over and own these different pieces so that we can take on other people and he can train other people to do these things in the business. And so that's the first turning point was when I kept over a period of three, four, five years, I just kept getting dropped in the deep end of new responsibilities 
in an agency environment across multiple different merchants and different business models, that was a really compact period of learning. It was a really accelerated period of learning. The second accelerated period of learning was with the most recent merchant that I worked for as an employee. I was the e-commerce manager for the largest online natural health products retailer in New Zealand. And I, it was just, I was very fortunate when I left agency land and I wanted to go back working merchant side because I'm a firm believer most people can't do agency forever. It's just too high stress. It's too many hours. It's just hard. Client services is a hard thing, right? And so I needed a break from agency life. I went working merchant side, and that was a that was a cakewalk in comparison just in terms of the amount of hours that I was doing and the stress and everything else. Instead of working across 10 clients, I was working across one, and I could go deep instead of broad. And so that what the great thing about that experience is I went from the theoretical to the practical in the sense that when you're architecting something as an agency, you're not the one that has to be the internal resource to help deliver all these projects to the business. Whereas when I was working merchant side, we reply, I just came to the business at a very fortunate time. They were in the process of needing to replatform ERP and they never had a CRM. So we were in the process of needing a CRM. We needed a new WMS. We needed a new OMS. We needed, we needed to replatform loyalty and marketing automation and a bunch of other things. Plus we were doing omni-channel systems integration to an existing point of sale system for retail. Plus we ultimately ended up migrating off of Magento One Enterprise onto Big Commerce Enterprise. And so over a period of over four years with that brand, I was able to go from the theoretical to the practical and work all the way from the initial architecture right through to implementation, go live and beyond. And so that, that taught me how difficult and how challenging it can be for merchants to go through that level of change as a business and all of the pitfalls and all of the ch challenges around change management and process management inside of a business. And it had really helped to develop my empathy gene for working with clients that are going through massive amounts of change in their business. And, uh, and I would say it's those two really key pivot points in my career that I can look back upon. And I can say those were probably the two most accelerated learning periods of my entire career. And total in quantum, it was probably a grand total of about 10 years total of, of time that had elapsed. But it really, it allowed me, because a lot of people that work agency side, they may have never worked vendor side before, and they may have never worked merchant side before, or people that only ever work merchant side as say yeah. a BA or as say an e-commerce manager or a head of digital or a CDO, they oftentimes have never worked agency side and they've never worked vendor side before. So I think, and I've never worked vendor side, but I've worked with enough vendors over time that I feel like I almost have. And I also offer consulting now to software vendors. And so I'm deeply embedded in some of these businesses. And I think if you can get that trifecta of experience or the closer you can get to that trifecta of experience where you can work, if you're going to work in digital and you're going to work in e-commerce, if you can work, do a bit of time agency side, if you can do a bit of time merchant side, and in a perfect world, if you can do a bit of time vendor side as well, I think that makes you a super well-rounded person in our industry. That gives you a breadth of experience that is just super, super useful wherever you end up making your kind of long-term career mark and whatever long-term career direction you take. I think if you can get those three tiers of experience, what I would consider three tiers of experience, I think that's a, that'll give you a massive leg up. Okay, that's really useful. Thank you. I think the... I think there are many people who are going to be working the agency side who are thinking they've got an opportunity to be thrown in at the deep end. I think there's thousands of opportunities out there, and I think see that you either, as you've said, sink or swim with it. If you just, you know, if you look for the positives in it and take it as an opportunity, that I think we've all got that within us because agency life is so like that, where people leave and say, and other people are asked to take on responsibilities and so on. So, yeah, that's really useful. It was interesting that you didn't say running your own e-commerce store, that, that that didn't grow your wealth of knowledge. It was it really started when you went into the agency. Look, I think owning an e-commerce business for as long as I did was important, but it definitely can become a little bit of an echo chamber. You can get so deep into running your own business that you know your skills, particularly if you do it for as long as I did, those skills become really business centric to that business, right? Yeah. It's like going and working for a single merchant for 20 years or 30 years. You might really know that merchant inside out and you might really be able to 
to bring some serious value to that business. And you have such deep domain knowledge within that business that you can pick up the ball and run across almost any division and department in the business and probably do okay with it. I think that the challenge then is to broaden your thinking. I was very good at running my e-commerce business and in our vertical and all the technical side of our business. And I worked directly with a freelance developer to do all the custom development of our site and everything else. And so I knew our business inside out. I knew our tech stack inside out because I was the one that architected it. I was the one that maintained it. I did all the marketing for our business. And so I guess that was massive for my learning, but I think it wasn't over time, it became so myopically focused on just our business that I don't know how, you know, sure, just understanding the way e-commerce works, super valuable, but yeah. being able to take and translate all of the learnings from that seven plus year period and translate that to lots of other businesses, I didn't have that skill set yet. I didn't yet have the ability to take my knowledge and my skill and my capability and work out how does that translate to helping other businesses with similar challenges because they oftentimes they were much bigger businesses and they had much more complexity to them than my business did. And we operated on a relatively small catalog of products. It was a rel we got up to about a million bucks a year in, in, in revenues, which is still relatively small. And I was now dealing with businesses that were doing five to $50 million a year in revenues. And their set of challenges from a scalability perspective were quite radically different to what they were in, in my, my, what I consider small business, right? Yeah, I think that being exposed to the variety of businesses and business models and verticals that I got exposed to in agency land, that was the benefit of being in that space, was just the breadth of situations that I walked into. Every yeah. single situation I walked into with a client, even if it was just an initial pitch, was different, right? Like yeah, they all yeah. had different tech stacks, they had different ERPs, they had different pause systems, they had different, they had, different bloody everything. And there was occasionally some commonalities, like you'd maybe see the same pause turn up two or three times in different situations, or maybe the same ERP. If you're working in fashion, you might see the same ERP turn up two or three times across different fashion brands. You were just starting to really get the feel for what some of the common design patterns were out there for specific verticals and specific brands. And I tell you, it was that breadth of experience that allowed me to get to a place where I started to really deeply understand those technologies and what it took to integrate with them, what it took to get in and out of them for this, all the stuff we were trying to achieve from an e-commerce perspective, how are we going to get orders back down and customers back down into them and all that sort of stuff. That really was super foundational for, for my future in terms of all the new technologies that would come laterally in terms of SaaS and in terms of lots of other new technologies that came on the scene way after those early days. It served me very well because the concepts translate even if the technology is different right the yeah, concepts yeah. that you learn still translate if you can adapt your learning to new situations that will give you a massive leg up and i think i can do that i think i can do that really well and i think that's a gift of mine to be able to take past learnings and adapt those into new situations and connect the dots and see the patterns between old scenarios and new scenarios that's a gift that i have and i think that's allowed me to be a really competent and really fast learning solution architect at a pretty senior level across the entirety of the commerce stack, where a lot of solution architects for e-com, for example, they really focus on just the e-com piece. They don't really have to think about the rest of the stack and they'll leave that to a system integrator or something else. Whereas I understand the whole stack now and I understand, even though I don't do the actual development myself, I understand what has to be put into place to allow all of these systems to play nice together. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So hopefully that, again, that, that may not help you in your specific situation, but I just think being able to expose yourself to the biggest breadth of experiences and challenges and new learnings as possible is really the way to, yeah. to, to learn. Repeating what you're doing, going in, let's say you work for a brand and you're an e-commerce manager and they've already got their tech stack. They've, let's say they've just gone through a replatform or something like that. If you keep going to mer work for merch, I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm saying that anybody in our industry, if they're an e-commerce manager and they keep going to work for brands successively that have already done major replatform projects and they're really just there for BAU, then yeah. it's not going to help them to learn what the process is like to go through a major change management program or a major yes. program of work full stop. They will not ever learn what that's unless they go through it themselves. And I didn't yeah. know what it was like as a merchant until I went through it myself.
And yeah. there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. And I think that if you can put yourself into novel situations as often as possible, it'll feel really uncomfortable. But getting back to that answer that I was saying where I go into no situation scares me now. It used to quite it used to make me quite nervous when I went in to meet with a new client and I was like, man, I have no idea what they're going to pull out of their backside in terms of what they're running, in terms of current tech, current processes, current organizational design, current data sets. Like that's that always felt quite intimidating because I felt, man, this is going to be something brand new that I've never seen before. And it was only once I started seeing recurring themes and I saw recurring patterns and started seeing some recurring systems. Then all of a sudden I went, hey, this, this is actually not scary anymore. This is, this is fun. This is a fun yeah, yeah. new challenge as opposed to a terrifying opportunity to prove my ignorance, which is what yeah. it felt like at the time. I felt, oh my God, my ignorance is going to show in every one of these engagements. But after you've done a hundred of them, then all of a sudden you feel like, oh, there's almost no situation I can walk into where I can't very quickly pick up where they're at, the systems they're running, the challenges that they're having. And sometimes now I can tell them what their challenges are even before they tell me. They'll yeah. just tell me. They'll just tell me where they're at as a business. They'll just tell me the systems that they're running. And I will immediately be able to tell them and recite back to them, oh, you're probably having a challenge with these five things, aren't you? And they'll go, how did you know that? Because I've seen this pattern before. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose the other scenario is where you you went into those to so many situations where you didn't know the ERP system, you didn't know the whatever, and it actually because you've been in a situation where you didn't know before and you've not failed, you know, where it's not crashed, you actually just become into a situation where you learn to go into scenarios where you didn't know it, and it became the norm then, I suppose. Totally. It desensitizes you to the fear, the more yeah. situations you get put in like that. And I became really good, really fast at reading API documentation of logging into systems and learning how they work for the first time and just finding my way around and playing around with new systems and, and looking at, because certain things translate. The concept of structured and unstructured product, product data translates across systems. And it's every system has its own unique v version of that. But you start to understand, okay, I need this piece of data to come from this system and I need it to go into this system. Then I need this piece of data to come across. Okay, these are the fa this is the field validation process in this system versus this system. But you start to learn some of the triggers for data flows? What are some of the triggers? What are some of the frequencies? Why does this happen? Why does it happen now? And why does it need to happen in this order? You just, once you've been through this a few dozen times, all of a sudden yeah. you start to really deeply understand some of the potential gotchas in any new major replatform project. And you also start to understand how and when to give advice. If a client, for example, comes to you and says, hey, we think we're, we're ready to replatform our e-commerce platform. But then when you get under the bonnet, you realize that your back office, your operational systems are an absolute disaster. You are not ready to undertake a front-end replatform project because you're going to be building on quicksand. We need to look at all this other stuff first. We need to look at data integrity. We need to look at all this other stuff first. Let's get that so that we're building on bedrock instead of building on quicksand. And you can have those conversations and you can tell them tangible examples of why if they do the e-commerce piece first but they don't have the back office to support it why that's a disaster why yeah. that is not a good thing why they shouldn't do it in that order you can give them tangible examples of the disaster that will bring to their business and yeah. all of a sudden you can help them connect the dots and they go oh that makes a lot of sense you know you're exactly right if we could have a ferrari on the front end but if we've got a you know if we've got a scooter on the back end that's going to be a real problem for us yeah and if you can very clearly articulate what those challenges are and why you're recommending they do suit certain things in a certain order based on experience based on real world experience man i tell you that is almost invaluable and that's what clients pay for they want to pay you to de-risk their project Yes. And, they, and the only way they can de-risk that for them is to have someone come in and tell them all the things they don't know. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Thanks, Jason. No worries, my friend. No worries, my friend. Anything else you want to cover off today or does you feel like we've covered some good ground? No, feel like we've covered the really good ground today. Thanks, mate. Look forward to the next one. Yeah. And you. Cheers, Jason. If you'd like to register for free for the mentor sessions with Jason Greenwood, Head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, and click Get Mentored by Jason. See you there.